From Viking halls to the cities of the future, Terrain Buffs will love our foreground hub. Watch gaming tables of all genres come to life at beastsofwar.com. Humanity has been driven from Earth, but now it's time to take it back. Join the reconquest and fight the scourge on the Drop Zone Commander Hub at beastsofwar.com. Hi everybody, welcome to What's in the Box. Today myself and John are having a look at an MDF kit, yeah? Yeah, uh, this is from Sarissa Precision. They're, I believe, uh, way back in my uni days, you know, not so long ago, but long <laughs> enough ago, um, a few of the friends in the, the Preston Gaming Group were saying that these were like the granddaddy of MDF oh, model right. kits, so these guys were are very experienced, so... <laughs> Alright, well, uh, what we're having a look at is the, the Horsia Glider. Mm -hmm. So this is right in your wheelhouse, John. This is a, an iconic piece from World War II, I'm going to guess. Oh yes, this, this is the glider that um, brought the, the British paratroopers in on D-Day, mm -hmm. and it's also what brought the fellas in for the Arnhem Offensive as well. Okay, uh, I'm just going to pop this open right away, and I'm taking no chances. I have a blade. <laughs> I will be careful with the blade, so I want to cut myself else. with the blade. Um, but yeah, the, these are potentially the most crude aircraft that have ever taken to the sky, um, <laughs> next to um, Wilbur Wright's first flight. <laughs> I think they're, they're slightly, le slightly about the same power as primitive as that. So. Well, I mean, like, it's, it's completely unpowered, yep. which is different to say the least. Well, gl gliding came first, mm. I think. Gliding was the first thing they did before they stuck an engine onto one and thought, hey, this might actually fly on its own. Yeah, but you see, here's the thing. Who thought it was a good idea to have soldiers essentially glide into a war zone where they couldn't get out of again uh, without fighting their way out? Well, the the, the background of glider-borne infantry is sort of sort of German, sort of Russian. Okay. The, the, the Russians were the first to use paratroopers, you know, to actually chuck them off a plane and <laughs> hope the parachute opens. But right. um, the the Germans and the Russians you worked on glider technology sort of in tandem mm. because this all goes back to the Treaty of Versailles. Right. Um, where the Germans weren't allowed a Luftwaffe, they weren't allowed an Air Force, a combat yeah. Air Force. So they, they were thinking of different ways of doing it and realised, well, parachute infantry is good, yeah. but they need something else with them. They need better armed guys as well, mm. so they figured that gliders would be the, the way to do it. Okay. And they, they came up with a few little designs and mm. they were alright, they carried seven men, they weren't that big. Mm. They used a rocket motor in some cases as well to, <laughs> to get them to move. Um, and they were used very effectively in the likes of Crete. Uh, okay. The landings in Crete, they used a lot of them there, and they used a lot of them through Europe as well. All right. Well, uh, let's, let's get stuck into the kit, mm -hmm. shall we? So, uh, first thing you're going to come across is this, which is basically showing you the different elevations of the glider. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how big it is yet. And does this also... Ah, yes, it's also yeah. our instruction manual. Mm -hmm. And it's actually... That's actually really nicely laid out to actually show you how the components all go together. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And it's... Three pages to actually build your glider. Mm -hmm. All right, so oh, we get some metal bits in here. Yeah, I believe they're probably weights. Weights, probably, okay. Probably, yeah. Just something to add a bit of half to the, the glider. Probably to balance it, I would imagine. All right. Well, uh, if we actually get these out of the way, mm -hmm. and we start actually having a look at some of the components. So, what are we looking at for these circular pieces? These, these look like the ribs for like the main fuselage. Okay. Uh, and this would be the floor. And I believe these are two like sort of structural uh, bits that sort of go mm -hmm. top and bottom and hold it all together. Okay, and this? Well, that's that's what I'm just saying. That's the bottom one with the the front wheel on it. Oh, it? I see, I see, I see. All right, and then that will be the the top one over on this side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, let's let's lift this out of the way. Oh, and this is how well I cut out this stuff is. It yep. just falls straight out. <laughs> it's it's one of those things you have to be careful of with HDF kits whenever you get them because. Some of them, you know, the lasers maybe not cut all the way through, or you know, the person's still learning the intensity, the beam width that they need to use. Yeah. Even just the amount of time that you're actually burning, because I've seen sometimes you can actually overburn mm -hmm. the the stuff, and what the laser does is it's vaporizing the material, which is interesting. At least I think so. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, so this is different. What is this? This is cardboard. This is what they're using on the kit for the skin of the the aircraft. I see. And then these little scores. Help you fold it into shape. Help it, help it fold into shape, yep. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing, oh, this is big. This is part of a wing. Okay, so these are your wings. Yep. And I'm assuming, yep, you need to be careful. These wings might just fall out. So you're starting to get an idea of the wingspan of this thing. Yeah, is like, that the full wingspan between the two of those? Uh, if you put the two of those together, yes, pretty much that's the wingspan. Okay. 
And so we, we're getting two of those. Yep. Uh, with more of these. What are these? Are these? These are struts to help form the, the actual leading edge of the wing. So ah, that so these are to give you that, that rounded shape. Yeah. Again, that's, that's one of the other things. Whenever you're actually designing aircraft, wing is not just a flat piece. It's actually got no. that, that weird aerodynamic shape. It has shape. to have that shape to reduce air pressure above it, to drag it up. Mm. All right, well, let's put the wings out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, the next layer, Ooh, more card. this is main fuselage. Yep, fuselage and cockpit. Uh -huh. And wheels. And wheels. They have little extra bits for the wheels. Yeah, and um, what, is this a door? That's part of the side ramp on the Horsha. Ah, I see. So can you actually have the side ramp open? Um, Probably. <laughs> okay. Uh, then moving further along here, so we've got this, which I believe, if I'm right, is actually the rear actuators, or the rear wings, yeah? Uh, yes, I believe. Are they called stabilizers? Possibly. Or ailerons? Possibly. You then got your, your tail fin here. Yep. Uh, I assume this actually just is for a bit of body shaping. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a few more struts and bits along here. Yep, looks like part of the landing gear. Uh, I see. Well, not landing gear, I guess, but, you know, takeoff wheels. Yeah, and then you have that, that rear fuselage done in card. Yep. You actually. Well, that's the wing. Is that? No, that's not the wing. That's the wing. You sure? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the skin for the wing. All right, if you're sure of this, John. Because sure. with this point on it, that's making me think, how could that be the wing? That's the wing tip. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'll pop this out of the way as well. Mm -hmm. And then our final one, if I flip it over, we'll be fit to see it better. That's the other thing with these kits. You can really see the burn side better than yeah. the other. Yeah. So I so assume this is just the last of the body. So you'll have the cockpit up yep, here. That's the cockpit. And then you have like these pieces, which are sort of joining, connecting pieces between cockpit, fuselage, and tail mm -hmm. and fuselage. Then you have a bit more bracing and some more landing gear here. That's all landing gear. All of that's landing gear. All of gear. that's landing ah, gear. Okay. All right. Well, it. It looks like a very interesting little kit. It looks like it's been nicely cut out of the sheet and yep. the actual frames. Very little wastage on the space. Definitely. Because that's the other thing. Whenever you're actually sitting down to design these kinds of things, you have to think about each sheet of HDF that you're working with, what you're putting on it, and what can fit into the, the dead spaces to actually yep. make the thing more efficient. But also, like, there is, when you say there isn't a lot of wastage, I mean, there kind of is because you, you get the big sheets that have, like, bits of the wings and stuff, and you could have probably fitted more bits on that, but at the same time, it starts to make the sheet very flimsy, yeah. I find. Yeah, the other thing is uh, some of the components, you have to actually figure out how they're going to fit on it. Yeah. So I mean, like, this has quite a few larger components. Mm -hmm. So I mean, fine, if this was something that was building lots of tiny little detailed bits into it, yeah, yeah, you would want to use up that space. But if it's bigger bits that aren't going to fit there, yeah, kind of let it go. Yeah, exactly. You know, don't try and overstuff the stuff. <laughs> Overstuff the stuff. Did I really Over, say? Yeah, overstuff the I stuff. Over, I said overstuff the stuff. Yeah. All right, uh, I'll tell you what, John, we'll take a break here mm -hmm. and I'm going to let you build this one to actually see how you get on. Okay, everybody, we're back. How was the build, John? A lot of fun. Really? I don't get to do a lot of HDF kits because Justin's really the, the expert in the, the studio for that, but. Well, I mean, I generally like working with HDF kits. Uh, I've not actually had a chance to play with any of Sarissa's stuff before, so I'm, no. I'm kind of sad I missed out on this one. <laughs> well, you know, we could always get you another one and you could give it a go see who built the, the better plane. <laughs> uh, you're really challenging me to build with timber. Not really, no. <laughs> All right, well, let's, uh, let's get a look at it here. So this is our, our built Horsha. It's huge. It is, because I mean, like, if you think, there's, there's the size of my hand. Yep. And it's like three hands across. And the detail is, you know, it's... It's not exactly a Tamiya kit or something hard plastic. It, yeah, it but, is HDF. Yeah, but, but uh, it's nice. It's got a nice charm to it. A Horsha isn't exactly a, a masterpiece of engineering in itself. Yeah. It, it's a masterpiece of mass engineering on itself and yeah. simple engineering. But it is so good. <laughs> it's huge. And you can see where I've not built it the best, <laughs> like along the bottom. But you see, I, I don't know, because I think you'll never really have this flipped upside down once it's on the tabletop. Well, hopefully not. Something went terribly wrong. <laughs> and does it does it have any features I need to know about? Um, move? Well, I couldn't get the ramp to, to open. Right. And I'll explain that in a minute. But yeah, the, cockpit, the cockpit comes off. Okay. And does it just slot in with a, a little slot piece here? It, ju it just rotates. Oh, it rotates? It just rotates. Right. So, so they rotate 45 degrees and then come off, and the tail also comes off. I see. So you could actually do a very easy wrecked version of this. Yeah, you really could. Yeah. And then, yeah, you can see the little connecting pins there. And mm -hmm. is there any, is there much detail on the inside just of this? Just a wooden sure floor. I can see this. Just a wooden floor. I have a, a, a sandbag stuffed in there. 
be a fun. I have a sandbag stuffed in there. Oh, right. To, to get it to sit properly, because I built it and then I realized that there was metal weights and I couldn't figure out where to go put them. Ah, right. So they would possibly went underneath the floor and... Or in the, the front, maybe cut. somewhere, yeah. All right. Well, let me see if I can pop this back on. Easy. And no, no, try it from the other angle. There you go. Haha. There we go. There you go. I think... Do you want to know there's only one thing I would say is missing from this little kit? Mm hmm you see this cockpit? Mm -hmm. I would get a little bit of clear acetate and put it into the windows. Yeah, I, I think I would as well. I think I would just give it a nice little touch. But so, the horseshoe, John. Effective or no? Very effective. Very, very, very effective. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference my old D-Day blog. Go ahead. Or vlog. Um, when I was talking about Pegasus Bridge, mm -hmm. uh, and it showed, like, when you walk off... Pegasus Bridge, and you're looking around, it, they have little pillars that show the landing sites. Yeah. Well, it was these that landed there. Right. And the closest one was 20 feet away from the end of the bridge. 20 feet. Yeah. He, he could have got out, looked at the bridge, and went, well, that's as close as I need to be. <laughs> yeah, but you're telling me the right now, I have seen a bridge too far and things like that. Yeah. But to get that close, you know, the, the pilot must have had nerves of steel. The, the best thing about it is, um, as, as much as the Arnhem parachute drops and glider drops were impressive in scale, yeah. think of D-Day as a whole other level because D-Day, these glider pilots were doing it at night, no lights, no navigation. No moon? There was a, a little bit of starlight to okay. them, basically. They, they had enough light, ambient light in yeah. the sky to sort of figure out where they were. Plus they were able to see the, the reflection of the starlight off the Kong Canal. Right. So the gliders pilots were able to find that and just follow it to the bridge. I'm amazed that none of them just crashed into like a two or three story building, like a church steeple or something. They knew they were all there. The the best bit about Dede is they they'd made tables that were like the size of the entire Cotentin Peninsula, and they yeah. were looking at them and going, you know, there's spires here, here's areas you need to avoid this, mm. and you know when they're doing their flight plans and stuff, they know where their tow plane release point is. Yeah. So the tow plane would typically leave them at about 30, 40 miles away from the drop zone, and they'd have to glide that 30, 40 miles Okay, so whatever. they would have been towed on in over German lines. Yeah, oh, they were towed right over the coast and then dropped. Right, and then the, the tow planes, did they have, like, paratroopers in them, or were they just tow, tow planes? Most, mostly they were tow planes. They were Halifax bombers for the British, so once they'd done their job, they turned and left. Right. But it let the Germans think, oh, that's a bombing raid coming over. Right. Oh, they're, they've turned away. Yeah. Not knowing that they've yeah. let go 30 or 40 of these things that are yeah. all heading to somewhere behind them. And each one's carrying X number of men. Yeah, about 12 or 13, I think, maybe up to 20. I think, you know, the strangest thing I remember hearing about D-Day was the fake GIs that they dropped. Oh, yes, the, the little, essentially, dummies. Yeah. With little firecrackers and stuff on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a genius idea. Let's just drop some dolls on the fringe uh, area. And, you know, if that's a silhouette that's coming down through the sky, the Germans are going to look up and go, oh, that's a, that's a fire trooper, I'll shoot that. Yeah. Waste some ammunition, eh? I'm not sure it was that effective. A lot of modern historians have went, eh, you know, really? Fun idea, though. And a few veterans sort of went, it didn't take us long to figure out what they were. Right. Because the popping would happen for a while, and then some of the Germans would be like, it's not really loud enough to be rifle fire, and they landed in the next field. Or something, there's something fishy about that. Right. In the meantime, these guys are landing at Pegasus Bridge and doing one of the most insane glider drops of the entire war. Yeah, yeah. And they did a very good job. And mm. I have to keep referencing that, that vlog where I'm stood at where one of the gliders actually touched down and yeah. stopped. And you just turn around and go, I could throw a stone and hit the bridge from here. You know, that, that's how close they were. See, th this is the thing. I actually haven't got to, to visit the location. I'm kind of jealous of you because there, there has to be a certain amount of that happened here? Mm -hmm. Wow. When, when you watch films like The Longest Day and Private Ryan to an extent, and you see them, you hear them referencing these areas, you're like mm -hmm. the Merville Battery, Pegasus Bridge, and you know, Omaha Beach and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And you stand there and like you see it in my vlog. It comes across a lot in my vlog. I'm stood at you're Merville. Like a puppy in your vlog. Just I'm, <laughs> I'm stood at Merville Battery nearly in friggin' tears because I'm stood there going, this is actually the spot where that particular infantry unit came to this particular spot to do that particular job and the scars are still on the walls and the bunkers from where they were actually doing it and you're like you know you get that sense that was it one of these holiday battlefield tours things say you know walking in the footsteps of 
of heroes or giants, yeah. you're definitely walking in the footsteps of giants mm. when you're going to D-Day or going to Normandy and looking mm. at some of these places, especially Pegasus. It's yeah. something else. See, th this is why Omaha Beach is on my bucket list. I mm. want to get there for a visit at least once in my life. And you want to do the run at low tide? I want to, yeah, I want to go there at low tide, maybe you and me, and have you and me just bomb it as hard as we can up the field, up the, <laughs> up the beach. Yeah, past all the summer. The, the not that I'm going to run very far, I'm not healthy. <laughs> past all the holiday homes with, with French people going, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah, but to actually see how long it takes you to do it physically with nothing holding you back. Yeah, and then putting into consideration there's beach obstacles, yep. there's mines, yep. someone's shooting at you, yep. you're wet, you're cold, you've just been thrown up in a landing craft that's been buffeted through five miles of sea. Yeah, and you've just had to actually take a bloody sea voyage to get there, and so you might be a bit unsteady on your feet. And you're carrying maybe 30 kilos of stuff. Yeah. Plus your weapon. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's... Like that, that's on my bucket list. Uh, I mean, like that's a question for everybody out there. What historical sites are on your bucket list, and what would you like to do at those sites? Mm. Right, uh, John, Porsche Glider, nice kit from Sarissa? Lovely kit from Sarissa, yeah. Right, uh, well, I guess you'll maybe see it in a, a Let's Play or something in the future. Oh, 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 one, you do? One, you do? one more thing. What's wrong? On the ramp. On the ramp, yeah. On the ramp. Uh, I think Sarissa needs to just look at the instruction sheet a little bit and sort of tweak it okay. very, very slightly. Okay. Um, the instruction sheet's over there. I may need to run uh, off camera to go no, get no, it. No, 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 no. No? It'll be right. okay. Just explain it. So, so the pegs for the ramp to actually open and shut yeah. are on the floor of it. Right. The Sarissa instructions have you build all the ribbing, right. put all that stuff together, skin the whole thing, then put the ramp on. Right. Now, you can't put the ramp on because you've just built everything locked into its position. You'd actually need to take some of those pieces apart Right. And actually build the ramp into the floor ah. before you start putting all the other sections on. Again, I think that's more of a, a case of being familiar working with HDF kits. Yeah. Because but, there are times whenever I'm building at them and I'll see something that I'm about to close off whenever I'm about to glue it because I then dry fit everything. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I hadn't quite figured out because the floor was a bit confusing it's, it's to me. It's the first time but, you've built the kit. Yeah. You know, so easily forgivable. I shall build another one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, everybody, get your comments in below. You know what to say. Myself and John will move on here. We'll see you in the next one. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now, and be sure to check out beastsofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming Let's Plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe, and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on. <laughs>